All right, welcome back again. We're, I guess, fortunate to all still be standing vertical. Who knows how many of us, us will still be vertical after this next week, but um, we'll find out very sh very shortly would be my guess. Um, I'm going to go to Uncle Eric's and get his inversion table and just stand on my head the whole time. Um <laughs> Um, I guess somebody's checked on him. I hope. Okay, okay. All right, all right. No, that's not, let's, let's, let's not scare him. All right, uh, last week we looked at Psalms chapter 10, and some of you were out, so I will not hold you responsible for knowing it. Although Jared, Jared's diligent enough, he probably knows everything we talked about without even ever see, having even seen it. Um, so uh, uh, we we looked at Psalms chapter ten, and today we'll be looking at Psalms chapter eleven. Does anybody remember what we discussed from Psalms chapter ten? Well, there. That's true. That is a direct quote, and you want to elaborate further upon that? Right. We, we 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 talked about how Psalms basically confirm something that I mean I think is known to most Baptists, especially Sovereign Grace Baptist people, but but confirms it in so much words is that given the opportunity, man will never seek after God of his own volition. He will never he will never to a certain point, I, 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 I'll, I'll say this: man, if man, man, man will make his own gods, but he will never seek the true God. Yeah, because it, all you have to do is look at the cultures around the globe. Man will make himself his own gods. We're 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 actually intrinsically built to believe in something. It, it's it's in our nature. It's in our very DNA. And in the absence of our flesh allowing us to <laughs> seek the true God, we'll just invent things. And and in a day where atheism and, and all this stuff is like, well, do we, we don't do that anymore. Oh, we do. It's just now we worship science and or some people, not not us specifically, but but uh, the secular world worships science and things and um, themselves. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Man, man will seek after a god, but he will never seek after the god of the Bible because the god of the Bible is antithetical to the flesh. And Psalms basically makes that statement here in chapter ten. Anybody else? All right, and that will bring us to chapter eleven, another Psalm of David. I think that's going to be a running theme that we're going to be seeing throughout the Psalms. Um, Psalms chapter 11 is interesting in that from what I was able to read outside of the context of the actual scripture probably did also take place in his time of his when he was running from Saul or it was at least wrote about that time um, not necessarily but potentially um, at a different time the um, the first half or the first couple of verses is actually a um, the questioning of David's actions, and then the last uh, four, four through seven in the verses is David's reply to this, to this, uh, to this thought pattern. And we're going to kind of dig into that as we go on. And and I will say this: the opening uh, of the first verse here says, "In in the Lord put I my trust." Now, he opens with this idea. It is it is basically the thesis. For the chapter, it is it is the statement for which everything that we're going to be talking about is going to be based upon. It is it is the opening line in this psalm, uh, and he, his his foundational truth and and a truth that I, it, it carries us into salvation. It carries us through our physical lives and will carry us on into in, into eternity. Is where do you put your trust? Uh, salvation is built upon this trust, and and, and I, I it always has confused me, and I've said this multiple times that people, saved people, can trust God with the most valuable thing, 
we can trust him with our never dying souls, but we can't trust him with the water bill. <laughs> we can't trust him with a car repair. We can't trust him with our own personal health. We 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 always shunt those things to other gods, if you will. We always shunt those things to other I, uh, uh, other things. But this opening thesis says, "In the Lord put I my trust." And then you have this question: How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow, and they make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, uh, there are two questions here with, a, with a, a statement of danger in between. The first is, how say you to my soul? And, and, and David is saying, how are you saying this to me, to, 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 my, to my spirit, to my soul? Flee as a bird to your mountain. Now, if you look at where um, David was at this time, uh, David was getting a lot of advice from his friends that he needed to get out of Dodge because Saul was after him. And, and, and Saul was king. Saul, was, Saul had all the power. And David was really just a guy, a guy that, yes, had had many victories, many very public victories, uh, had a minor amount of support. He did have a band of, of, of mighty men uh, that, that roamed about with him. But David, was, they, they, were, they were singular motes of light in a field, in a field of darkness. And uh, there is this advice for him to to flee away, to by his own strength get. And why? Why do they need to see? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. So they, it, it presents this this present danger. He said, not only not only do you need to get out, but even now the arrows have become ready for your defeat. For your defeat, and it says that it would shoot privily. And I. I it, it's interesting that in a lot of scripture, um, arrows and darts are, are actually very oftenly contributed to Satan, uh, the fiery darts of the wicked. Uh, uh, the, uh, the ability uh, of them to, uh, and in this day and time, you have to think about ancient weaponry. When you're, when you're talking about, this, I think when you're looking at the Bible, it's always good to look in context of the time. The bow was the pinnacle of weapon of weapon technology of the age for it, it was accurate it could punch through armor like that uh it was it they were they were fairly easy to make and mastery of the bow could make you a deadly force upon the battlefield long before chariots and and infantry on foot could reach you your bow could take them out and what he, he's saying here is that your your danger is not only is not only present and ready because it says bow upon the string the arrow upon the string he's they're literally bending them back they're, if this was a compound bow you're pulling back and you're getting that little lock as the as the uh, um, the pulleys reinforce your bend it is every, everything is ready not only is it there, but it's going to shoot privily you're not going to see it coming you're not going you're it, it, this is this is this is a stealthy attack it's a hunter. Uh, how a hunter goes for a deer. Um, there's a lot of bow hunters in this county, and they, and they talk. Uh, they say, uh, I talk to them all the time, and and they'll tell you, well, I didn't go after this deer because they weren't ready yet, or I didn't go after this deer because they were they they, they had too much brush in the way, or I want to let this one live a little longer. And what they say out of context, they never actually say with words, but in the context is they never knew I was there. I am deciding if they live or die. I am deciding if they, and this is our enemy. This is our, and, and, and a lot of times it is the worming ten t temptations that become the arrow that gets you. Something else about bow hunting too is a lot of times when you hit a deer with a bow, they don't die on the spot. They run for a while, and what ha they're bleeding to death. Uh, the, uh, a lot of times, unless you have a very specific type of arrowhead, it can pass just straight through them, and they can run as much as a mile before they eventually die from blood loss from the from the arrow passed through them. If you don't hit them just right, they may not die at all. Um, and these darts that come from Satan, and I, and honestly, I think at times from our own flesh too, are these worming temptations that get in our lives, and yes, the arrow passes through us. Maybe we feel the pain of the arrow, but we run away, and we think we're off clean. But 
the damage is still done. The, and, and these people are presenting this very, very sound argument to David here. It's like, you need to get out because you're in danger. You're in grave danger. And then it says, if the foundations uh, be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, on first glance of reading, I thought foundations, are they talking about something spiritual? Are they talking about the, you know, our true foundation? But first of all, they put foundations plural, and they said that they had the option of being destroyed. And God's foundation can't be destroyed, and there's not more than one foundation. We have a singular foundation in Christ and God. So this foundation must be something else. So I did a little bit of research. I did read some commentaries, which, you know, you can only carry man's word so far, but it does give you some enlightenment on some of this stuff. I did a little bit of uh, research about the very word foundations, and this seems to be some type of political vo- bo- body, which if you think thinking when this was written, Saul was the political bo- body. And what they're saying is morality of the very foundation of law in our society has crumbled. It is, it is falling apart. And how are you going to stand, David, when even the very law of the land is after you? I think this specifically is something that could ring pretty true in our day and time for us. What are Christians going to do when everything is crumbling down around you. Now, you think about a, a, a house that's been hit by an earthquake. It's usually not necessarily the earthquake that ends up killing people. It is aftershocks and collapses afterwards that end up killing because you dive for cover when the earthquake's taking place, and all the earthquake does is weaken the structure, gets it to doing this right here. And then everybody's like, oh, it's over. Everything's fine. They creep out, and then the house collapses on them. And that's where you get a lot of your fatalities and whatnot is these aftershocks and collapses. And, and what they're saying is here, this foundation, the very foundation of your society has has left off from God. They've been destroyed. The, and and now, n- now there's no law or morality. And, and you could say, well, you know, our, our law is supposed to legislate morality, but now they've, they've gone a step further. You know, it used to be laws where if you were a horse thief and you stole a horse, you lost your hand. It was, it was a legislation of morality. It was telling you, you can't steal. And if you steal, there is a, a in some cases, very physical punishment for that. But now we're legislating unrighteousness. Now we're saying it's okay to be married and a sodomite. Now we're saying it's okay for, like in the state of California, for underage children to be having intercourses with these people. Now we're legislating that uh, that God, and, and I don't know that if he was ever in our schools, but if he ever was, now we're legislating him for, let's just remove him completely from our school system. Let's take prayer and and, and, and all these things out, out, out that we're, we're li- they're, now they're literally reg- legislating unrighteousness, and I think this is what he means by the foundations are destroyed. We, we literally don't have a solid rock to stand on, or at least that's what the claim they're making today. Because he's saying, what are you going to do now? You, you've, you've lost the government. You basically have lost the one, the ba- what they perceive, the one thing you stand on, Saul. You know, Saul liked you. Saul, you, you helped Saul out in a, in a big way in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16. But that's gone. And there are people that are, that are, that are looking to fire these arrows at you. And you need to go. You need to flee to the mountain. You need to get out. And then in verse 4, we get David's reply. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's temple is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Now David's reply to all this wishy-washy, very timid Let's lay down and let's put our neck on the chopping block and let's you know let's let's bow the knee to the the, the, the pressures around us. David says, he said, "What do you if you look at the very what can the righteous do?" And David's refrain is, "The Lord's still in His temple." You know why we don't have to? I, I don't have to worry whether um, I don't have to worry about the president. Want to know why? Because the Lord is still in His temple and. His government is unchanging. His power is unchanging. His his kingdom is unchanging. He has a solid foundation. He has a law that hasn't changed in 6,000 years of history that is recorded for us. David's reply in a world 
that seems to be going topsy-turvy. And again, I think it speaks very heavily to the world that we're living in now and maybe always has. But in a world that just doesn't seem to have any kind of sure footing is just remember God's still on the throne. He still has a, he still has a place of power if, if money's got you down. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If political, if political unrest has you down, remember for this cause have I raised up Pharaoh. If sickness has got you down, remember he's still the great physician. How many issues of blood and miracles did he work upon sick people? People with uncurable diseases. People like Joey in the back who, who seemingly have no ability to, at least by modern medicine's abilities, to ever come back. And people like him, he grabbed them by the forearm and he lifted them up and says, you're healed now. And they were. In every aspect of our life, he is a complete and trusting fulfillment. And this takes us back. This first, this first verse 4 takes us right back to the thesis of the chapter, trust in the Lord. Where are you going to put your faith? If you put your faith in modern medicine, you will be soon upset. If you put faith in our government, you will be soon upset. And I actually think, as you know, I... I, I there are things about Donald Trump's, Donald Trump's administration I don't care for specifically, and there's things that I think that he's done well. But I think a lot of Christians saw him as a beacon of hope, and they put their trust in that. And now with the seemingly slowly tilting toward Democrat vibe we're getting in this crazy, unbalanced election, people are losing their minds. Why? Because they put their trust in something that is, is constantly shifting. You knew this was coming in four years, right? That there was a possibility for change. Why? Because that's man-made. Obviously, there was going to be a chance for change. But we can still look toward... And, and if you look toward cash, I'm sorry, we're, we're living in a, in a world where the monetary system also is kind of the dollars up, the dollars down. Uh, people, you know, if you, if you, you want to play security in the dollar bill, look at the people that did that back in the 1930s. And those same people were jumping from buildings... When the stock market crashed, we can put our trust in no other than the Lord. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked man and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Now, verse 5 presents an idea here. He says, it, 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 it goes back actually to where it says, his, his, his eyelids try the children of men. Now, when he says that, it means that all of us are judged by what? The same barometer. The, the, the Ten Commandments are God's liquidation, if you will, of what he expects of mankind. And by that law, all men are held accountable. If you've broken one, you've broken it all. And, and basically, the end of verse 4 says, try the children of men. That's everybody. That's all of us. And then he says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth, uh, uh, loveth violence his soul hateth. Now, he says that he's going to try the righteous. Now, in all of this, and I said that you need to put your trust in the Lord, and it's, I didn't say it was going to be easy. And, and, and this is where people start losing the ability. It's easier to put your faith in a scientist. Why? Because I can see what the scientist is doing. I can talk to the scientist. I can see the result of a scientist's work. But God is a little bit more ephemeral at times. The works of his hands sometimes don't play out for centuries after we're gone. You think Paul wrote his letters and thought, you know what, one day somebody's going to be teaching from this, somebody's going to be preaching from this. No, I bet Paul just thought, you know what, these people need a message and they need it now. And it got passed around, and it got passed around, and, 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 and the inspired Word of God did what it does, and it lived, and it sprung anew over and over and over again. But that didn't take place until long after Paul was gone. And I think when, when if you look, it says they would try the righteous. That means he's going to turn up the heat on you. What is... Um, Oh, I forget uh, the passage, but you know what I, you'll know what I'm talking about when he says that he's going to uh, uh, look for wood, hay, and stubble, and 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 and, and all that's going to be burned away. But that which is pure, that's going to rise. That's going that's going the 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 ones that can handle the heat, 
and the aspects of who you are as a Christian that can handle that heat, that's going to rise to the top, and the impurities are going to be washed away. And what do we come out? We come out pure, and not only more pure, but more pure gold, more, more pure metals are more valuable. We're more valuable for the tribulations that we face. So when I say, well, you, you have to just put all your finances at the feet of God, just sort of push them there, and leave them there, that's easier said than done. Because your flesh will tell you, that's stupid. You need to go get some more work. Obviously. By the work of your own hands, you need to... And, and, and that basic that ideology has its eventual goal in, I will tear down my barns and build greater. That's where you end up with that line of thinking. Or I have a sickness that seemingly the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with me. And we'll just throw ourselves at the feet of science. I'll find a new doctor. I'll find a better person. I'll find somebody who can give me a different diagnosis. And we throw ourselves at the feet of man when we should be throwing ourselves at the feet of God, but it's not easy. How hard do you think it was for Job after... I, don't, I can't imagine losing my children... I can't imagine losing everything that I've ever known. And then on top of all of that, just essentially, it said that he scraped the sores with, with, with basic, essentially broken pottery. Essentially, just writhing in pain. Not finding a comfortable place to turn your body. And still look to the heavens and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. All the while, your spouse, the person who's supposed to be with you through everything is saying, just curse God and die. End it, please. Can you imagine that? That's how you get tried. I didn't say it was going to be easy, but every time he said, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord. And yes, Job had some problems. I think his friends enumerated those. <laughs> uh, but I think on the other side of that, Job came out a far stronger and better Christian and probably with a taller hedge around him than he ever had before. Because of what? He put his trust in God. He's, if, if I lose everything, everything that I ever hold dear, it is still the will of my Father. Uh, and then it says that he, that, that he hateth the wicked. Uh, verse 6, the wicked... He shall rain down snares, fire and brimstone and horrible temptest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Now, it does seem in our day and time that wickedness prevails on every hand, that wickedness holds the upper hand in every fight, that wickedness uh, seems, to, uh, seems to gain ground while we steadily lose ground. Some of that is to our own fault. I, I will never not hold us accountable for what we should be accountable for. But this is their domain. This is their world, and their father holds dominion here. He has power over all of it. Of course they're excelling. They're excelling because they're doing what he wants them to do. But we look here and see this is, this is, this is their end. This is the, the portion of their cup. And it says, It shall rain down snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. He's going, to just, he's, going, he's going to judge them according to their works. Actually, the fire and brimstone reminds me specifically of Sodom and Gomorrah. That place got very wealthy and very big before it was destroyed. That place, based entirely upon sin and the trading of... I would even say trading in sin gained so much wealth until its ultimate destruction. And it was only, I really think, uh, by Lot being just and possibly also due to Abraham's intervention <laughs> that anybody survived that destruction. And this is, this is what uh, da David said, I don't have to worry about those that have got bows bent against me because that is their ultimate end. I talked to Brother Kenny while I was cutting his hair, I, 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 and I, I liked his sermon on uh, uh, victorious eschatology because I always I, I'm in very close agreement on him with this. It doesn't really matter how you 
interpret the back of the book. The ultimate thing is when you read chapter 22, we win. We're the ultimate victors. We come out on top, and we not only do we come out on top, we stand tall, and our God stands taller before us. And all of the world bows at his feet. And we're so, but we're so fearful of, of little things in life. So fearful of what might happen around us. For the righteous Lord loveth the righteous, and his countenance behold, behold the upright. Now it says that he loveth the righteous. Um, I, think, I think we can find ourselves not in that case at times. Now we have a covering righteousness based upon our salvation. If you're saved, you've got blood that when God perceives you, he perceives the blood of his son. But we get away from God quite a bit. I know I do. I haven't reached sinless perfection yet. And I, I'd venture to say if everybody in here was honest, we would all volunteer that very same statement. <laughs> Meaning that sometimes we can be outside of this protection. And I think a lot of time what ends us up being outside of that is we go looking for greener pastures. Why do sheep wander? And I actually talked about this in one of my classes. We, 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 had, we had a cow that wanted to look, that, that wanted to, uh, be with other cows. We didn't have another cow for her to be with, and she would often jump the fence and go over to the horse boarding farm next to us and hang out with the horses. Now, they weren't of the same kind, but what did she want? She wanted a different pasture and better c- and different companionship. And a lot of time we feel like we're alone, and over there it's like, they're not quite like me, but they're close enough. And that's how we end up getting out in the world, is it not? We want to go, we're cow, but we're okay with hanging out with the horses, even though they're two totally different breeds. We're two totally different sets of people, but we're looking for something better. And when we're outside of this, we're, we're not putting our trust in God. We're not looking, we're, 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 we're not doing the work that he set for us to do. And God's like, well, you know, what happens over there at the horse farm happens to you. If only more often we could come to our senses like the prodigal son and say, what am, what am I doing here? Just have that sort of blink, blink moment where you're like, how did I arrive here at this place in my life? And then not only come, I think sometimes we come to that realization, we're like, but you know what, eating, uh, eating what the hogs won't even eat seems pretty good. I think that's where we, the, uh, the actual, where we usually go with that realization. But what did the prodigal son do? He stood up, he started walking back home. I don't think you can win your salvation. I don't think you can walk to God, but I think Christians can start making their way back home. All right, are there any questions or comments about chapter 11? I've probably rambled a little bit off of the main topic, but I'm, I'm a rambler. I'm a rambling man. Uh, <laughs> Praise the Lord for it. Right. Mm-hmm. God gave us dominion in the garden, and he was too much to come in the world. But now he saved us, and he's redeemed us, and he's recommissioned us, if you will, with that dominion. And I think we're supposed to look about the world, and um, we take the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ from within us, and we take as a, we, we go into this world as ambassadors from that kingdom. So, like he talks about God's unchanging government and His law that hasn't changed for six thousand years, and we take that law in our hands. This world for the betterment of this world, bringing all things under the subjection and submission to Christ. And uh, I think our calling is to find out how do we do that practically. Right. If your calling is how do I how do I cut hair in such a way that I'm exercising godly dominion? How do I practice in health care in such a way that I'm extending the dominion of Christ or whatever it may be? And uh, all of us should be seeking to do that. When uh, David saw Goliath, he would have thought, man, that's so big, how can I miss? Right. <laughs> and so we as Christians, we look at this world, and there's so many areas where people need to hear the gospel, and people need to be instructed in the things of God, and the world needs to be corrected by the word of God. So there's so much for us to do. Yeah, there, there, and, 
and I, you know, there's there's actually, you know, a lot of, if you want to look at this in a, in a very stark black and white uh, scale, there's a lot of places that have these foreign tribes that haven't had contact with mankind. They won't allow missionaries to go in there and talk to them. And it's because when a, it's not just a, not just a white or ethnic thing here, but when a, Christian bearing the word of God goes into a place, that place is irrevocably changed. And a lot of times they will abandon their culture, not to the detriment of their culture, but because they realize, hey, everything that we've been doing is pagan and wrong. And we, and, and and a lot of these governments seek to, well, th- they need to keep their indigenous culture. We need to, we need to, we need to respect all that stuff. And, 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 but, you know, I think in our day-to-day life, we, we go and we respect the indigenous culture of our communities far more than we, than we should. We should, we should, we should be looking to change. We should be looking to make, make strides and to touch as many people as we can for the Lord. Mm-hmm. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Brother Jerry, you look like you have something on your mind. Okay. <laughs> hey, Bill Larry. Ordination, simply being ordained to a religious school. And, uh, you know, Paul was sent out and that was it. There was no other type of instruction. So just think about it. And like I said, Pro Baptist Church and we'll regroup on Sunday, even though he won't be here, and just to talk about some things. Um, we kind of tentatively wanted to meet mid December. I don't know that we can meet that night. If not, sometime in January. So just think about it and pray about it because I know he wrote it to Jared, the pastor of church. Um, but again, I don't necessarily see that in scripture. So I think everybody should see Billy, sister, his uh, brother, and think about this. And please ask their opinion what he believes. We're, we're not going to agree. Right. Uh, we, uh, we were trapped in a car together for about eight hours looking for a house that we never did find. Uh, I'm just not going to lie because this is what we believe. This is sincere about coming here. This is what you're going to see. This is what you're going to hear. And ask him, what do you think about that? All right. Um, If there's no further ado, you are dismissed. Have a great week. Have a blessed week. May God go with you.